<clears throat> so hi, everybody. I can't yet see anyone. Looks like people are connecting to audio. Um, if people could just give me thumbs up or turn on your cameras if you're comfortable with that. And I know you're here for sure and can hear me and everything. And I'll get started in just a sec. Okay, we got at least one thumbs up. Thank you, Gloria. Yeah. Okay, well, I think we're due to start now. So, so let's go. So um, yeah, hi and welcome. I'm really happy to be presenting on this on this topic today. I've got a lot to get through. Um, so, so I'll go ahead and get started. Um, do feel free to interrupt anytime, either orally or with a with a message, I'm, uh, I really don't mind being interrupted, and um, there will, I, I won't be surprised if there's some things you you want to stop and, and talk about. <clears throat> so um, they say every good presentation begins with a, a quote from Family Guy. So uh, here's mine. Maybe you've seen this before, maybe you haven't, but our next love story is Romeo and Juliet, a five hundred year old tale about horny preteens <laughs> that society somehow decided is classy and not perverted, even though two middle middle schoolers are banging it. I don't know if you've um, seen this before. I was actually hoping to play the clip for you, but um, uh, but it's no longer available on on YouTube. It, it was, uh, but it's but it's been removed. Um, but you know, potentially something fun to share um, with your with your students if you're teaching the play. And and there's more. I don't know if any of you've seen any of the episode, but um, they there are several little sort of skits where they. Um, reproduce in a rather comical way um, scenes from the play. <clears throat> uh, so here is what we are going to go through today. So I want to go over the prevailing romantic view. Um, you know what, one thing I need to do, this will take me just one second. Um, I'm, I've got a highlight, a cursor with a highlighter and I forgot to turn that on. So let me just take one second to do that. Okay, can you see that? You should be able to see, right? A little yellow cursor. Can someone give me a thumbs up, maybe? I can I can see it on like the mini screen. Okay, yeah, thanks, Claire. So yeah, this will be helpful because we'll, we'll be looking at some passages and stuff. So, so um, yeah, the prevailing um, and nearly unchallenged romantic um, conception of the play. Some bases for skepticism, my absolute favorite topic. Um, uh, yeah, well, 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 I've got lots to say. <laughs> on that and then and then today's question which um is looking at uh why romeo kills himself and um does it appear to be for love or does it appear to be something else going on um uh as a, as a bit of a, a bonus um i'll give a brief introduction to this uh this book called the anatomy of melancholy i don't know if anyone has ever heard of this book um, it's incredible. So it's this Renaissance study of depression. It's the only book this 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 guy Robert Burton wrote. Um, it's absolutely brilliant. Uh, it's been called the best book ever written, if you can believe it. Um, that was someone by, by someone at, at the Guardian, um, and it really is just so interesting and 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 that and, and often hilarious. Um, and interestingly enough, um, contains an explicit reference to Romeo and Juliet. It, it's actually the only book or only contemporary um, sort of response to Shakespeare's play that we we have. This really deserves to be better known than it is. Um, I, personally, uh, I, I was fortunate enough at university to do um, a couple of great books programs, if you've heard of those, and I've uh, never heard about this book. It, it wasn't until my Shakespeare studies and more specifically my obsession with Romeo and Juliet began that I learned about this. And um, yeah, it's, it's quite the masterpiece. A little bit about me. <clears throat> So yeah, I've got like a decade and a half old obsession um, with with this play. Um, I, I am working on a short book on it. Um, I don't know when that'll be ready. It's taking forever. Um, but yeah, to date, I've written over 50,000 words on the play. So I wrote um, a 25,000 word uh, chapter on, in, in, on it uh, on it in my doctoral thesis. Uh, I actually wanted to do my, my entire thesis on it, but my supervisor didn't love that idea. Um, and then I've got a couple of published articles 
on it. And then maybe, you know, about Substack, I started the Substack a few years ago, and so I've written a bunch more on there. And that's that's been really fun to try to um, write for a, a non-specialist audience. Um, my study of Shakespeare began in, in kind of a unique way. So um, I definitely find myself with some dissenting um, uh, or, uh, you know, non unorthodox or non-orthodox um, views on, on some works. And it seems to have something to do with this kind of weird accident that um, that my, the, like pretty much the very first thing that I read, it's not literally true because I, I, I got, you know, the usual sampling in high school and stuff, but um, the university I was doing Eastern religions, if you can believe it. And then again, kind of by accident, um, uh, well, went, uh, joined a, a this great books program, it was down in the States. And the first thing we read was Venus and Adonis. And, it's this poem, right? It's this narrative poem. I mean, most people haven't even heard about it, but it was actually Shakespeare's most popular work in his own lifetime. And I think it's brilliant. Um, I published my first article on it, um, arguing that it retells the myth of Narcissus. If you're familiar with that story, I'm sure many of you probably are. Um, uh, it's sort of revealed at a certain point that Venus is beholding her own reflection in Adonis's eyes. Um, so that was my first published article called Shakespeare's Narcissus, arguing Venus, um, was is the poem's um, sort of true true narcissist, um, and the other thing I would say about this is just that I kind of feel like it taught me how to read Shakespeare, right? And so it's this poem, not this play. Um, for many Shakespeare scholars, the assumption is you need like that Shakespeare's primarily, if not exclusively, this playwright, and to to understand uh, a work, you have to see it, right? Yeah have to see it performed. And I've just, from the beginning, come at his works with a completely different perspective, like a more literary or, or poetic one and, and, and applied close reading to the plays. And, and that's very much what I've done with Romeo and Juliet and would argue, maybe somewhat provocatively, that um, the poem really demands that kind of in, intense scrutiny. Um, final point about uh, me is just that I, I studied the play blind. Um, in what sense do I mean that? <clears throat> um, so I was in a graduate course and it was coming up next. It ended up being delayed, like the start of our study of the play. I got interested in it. I started studying it obsessively for weeks and then and then months, creating notes, like hundreds of pages of, of notes. So I was just like, wow, there's so much going on here. It's so much more difficult and complicated than I, than I thought or uh, assumed. Um, but I, I mean, blind in the sense I had no clue what critics thought. Um, as I say, I was sort of re really quite new to Shakespeare. It wasn't what I began, or, sorry, expected to study. Um, anyway, when I finally looked at the critical literature, I was I was really surprised. Um, I couldn't believe actually what what critics were saying about it. That in in just a slide or two, I'm going to quote um, some major critics. Um, to sort of capture the prevailing view and um let's just say i, I found myself deeply at odds with with that view and have um, kind of had this project ever since i guess <clears throat> yeah so here is the critical status quo so no real surprises here maybe um so one of the greatest love stories in western literature perhaps the greatest of all expressions of romantic love is healthy and normative passion as western literature affords us um, you may very well know some of these names, right? These are some of the biggest names in the field. Um, to sum this up, the critical view is basically indistinguishable from, from the popular one. Um, that may surprise some of you to hear. Um, it's interesting. One thing I observe, uh, I'm part of like some Facebook, Shakespeare Facebook groups um, for secondary school teachers. And my impression is that um, secondary school teachers are more skeptical uh, about the the play and teach a more skeptical reading of it. And so that's interesting. I'll, I'll, I'll be interested to hear from some of you and, and learn if that's true. So there seems to be this gap actually between the secondary and the post-secondary uh, interp interpretation of the play. And let's just say I, I find myself very much on the side of the, the secondary uh, reading. Um, one other thing I'll mention just briefly is there are skeptics. I, I'm certainly not, not, not alone in sort of reading it more skeptically, but they're relatively few. And one of the frustrating things is you won't hear about them. Um, like in critical editions of the play, you would expect, I would expect to be introduced to a more skeptical, if not satirical interpretation of the play. And you just, you just aren't. And like, 
some of the best skeptical readings of it just aren't mentioned. They aren't mentioned in introductions. They're not mentioned in bibliographies. Um, it's really quite surprising. There, there really is a kind of orthodoxy in uh, about this play where like it's it's what these guys say here and and there are relatively few um, dissenting voices. <clears throat> Um, so there is evidence to support the romantic interpretation. I, I would not dispute that. And here are sort of the primary points um, before we look at uh, sort of another, another side. So um, as everyone knows, their love is both instant and mutual, unlike Romeo and Rosalind, right? Uh, he likes her, but she doesn't like him back. Um, they do commit their lives to one another, right? Before a priest, right? So this suggests it's not just some fling. Uh, they do take their lives for each other, at least appear to. I mean, they're, they refer to each other before they, they kill themselves and stuff. Um, and then maybe most importantly, their, their deaths seem to have this redemptive dimension, right? So there's their, their families that are, are at odds and there's actually a lot of violence and even death and bloodshed. And that all seems to come to an end at the end as a result of their, their, their deaths. Okay, <clears throat> that said, <laughs> there are a lot of bases for skepticism, in my opinion, and we're going to go through some of my, some of my favorite. <clears throat> so uh, let's, let's start with, with this. Um, Romeo is the object of satire throughout the play, most notably by his friend Mercutio, but also by some of the other, by some of the other characters, including the, the friar and the chorus those three are arguably the most three most important commentators on on the action um this particular line uh you can see i've got it highlighted um this is in act two i think it's scene three and um romeo appears all of a sudden and there's this joke here i'm not going to get into that but the, but then Mercutio says now is he for the numbers that petrarch flowed in so in my view this is a hugely significant illusion. And um, this is actually the basis of my, my doctoral thesis. Um, so what, what's so important about it? Well, Petrarch, as, as you probably know, is the biggest name in the English Renaissance. He's the most influential writer. Um, he didn't originate this, the sonnet, but he popularized it. And um, so in, in saying this, by the way, numbers means like poetic numbers. Like So just to sort of paraphrase this, um, he's suggesting well, the implication is that Romeo is a, a walking, talking parody of the Petrarchan lover. And um, so what makes that such an important um, uh, illusion? Well, so several things. One, one, one thing you may not know, so apart from Petrarch just being like the biggest name in the Renaissance to start with, he's, his influence on English literature is at its apex at in the mid 1590s, exactly when the play was written, right? So in other words, sonnets, right? This is what he, what he again, he popularized, are, are just everywhere. There's this great quote I love from a critical edition that says something about like sonnets are like pouring down from the sky, something like that. So they're just everywhere. And so um, so there's there's a reason to kind of respond then satirically, right? And, and several authors did. And I argued in my doctoral thesis that Shakespeare is one of those, and I argued, I won't go on about this too much, but um, that he's satirizing Petrarch or Petrarchism, so the imitation of Petrarch, because all these other English writers were also um, imitating, right? Writing sonnets in imitation of Petrarch, so that Shakespeare um, satirizes Petrarch in four or five works all written in the 1590s. Um, I won't go on too much more about that, but just like one quick example, Love's Labor is Lost. I don't know if any of you are familiar with it. Absolutely brilliant play, one of my, one of my favorites. Um, and um, maybe the key fact about it is that it, it features a group of sonneteers, so these men, and they, they it, it's really funny actually. At the beginning, they, they commit to um, a period of abstinence from worldly pleasures, including, and, uh, among other things, they're not gonna woo any women, then they realize a group of women are, are arriving at their court like imminently and like, oops, and of course they fall in love. And, but then they proceed to write these sonnets to the women to try to like win them. And the sonnets are like the worst thing ever. 
and the women mock them and it's hilarious and wonderful. And so that went pretty clearly, uh, pretty indisputably, I might, I might even say a satire that Petrarch or Petrarchism and, and my um, contention was and is that, that Roman Juliet actually uh, so, so forms part of that pattern of Shakespeare's satirical response to, to the Italian poet. Um, another favorite topic. So the presence of Cupid in Romeo and Juliet. Um, I have to say, I, I have seen virtually no work on this topic. And in my view, it's like a hugely interesting and, and arguably hugely consequential one. Um, so these lines maybe recognize uh, they're, they're from the encounter of the famous moment, right? Romeo and Juliet at her window. And basically Juliet asks Romeo how he, how he got there. And this is his answer. With, with love's light wings did I overperch these walls. He goes on, for stony limits cannot hold love out and what love can do that dares love attempt. Therefore the kinsmen are no, no stop to me. So love's light wings, it, this is clearly an allusion to Cupid. Um, many critical editions note this fact. Some don't, kind of bizarrely. I, I don't know why they wouldn't. Um, uh, in, in my opinion, these L's should all be capitalized. That's, that's sort of a separate topic, right? I mean, the personification is so clear and unambiguous. I, I think it justifies capitalization to, to I think that actually be helpful to draw attention to the personification. Um, in any case, um, Romeo here is saying essentially, Cupid led me here. And that's really significant <laughs> for a bunch of reasons, most of which I can't really get into, but um, one is that he's complaining of his subjugation to Cupid at the very beginning. Um, I, think I'll, I think I've got a slide on that later. So we'll actually see uh, a quote from that. And so it, he seems to be betraying the fact that Cupid is responsible for his, both his first and second loves. Um, the other thing is just to think about who else, like what other relationships Cupid is responsible for. So most famously, um, um, Titania and Bottom, <laughs> right? So A Midsummer Night's Dream, as you, uh, I'm sure, are all aware, Puck uh, uses love juice to make the lovers fall madly in love. Titania is the most notable instance of that, um, falls for Bottom, but, but the key detail about the love juice is that it comes from a, a flower called Cupid's flower, right? It's been hit with an arrow of Cupid. And so this is like this, let's just say unexplained mystery, right? That Romeo too would be implying that, that like he too is one more Cupid driven lover. I, I think it's really significant. I won't go on about it too much more. Um, yeah, speaking of Titanian bottom, so elsewhere, right? We know Romeo and Juliet fall in love at first sight. Well, who else falls in love at first sight? Well, the most explicit example in Shakespeare is Titania for bottom. So here she is, right? Falling for him on the first view. So in my view, a basis basis for skepticism. Um, how about this? This is a, this is a, a big topic. Um, <laughs> Romeo is like really, really violent, <laughs> like more violent than I think most people appreciate. Um, this is him right near the end, threatening his servant Balthazar. Balthazar has helped him get to the tomb. And now all of a sudden he's, he's telling him basically to get out of here. And if he doesn't, right? But if thou jeal jealous dost return to pry, and what further I, sh uh, in what I further shall intend to do, by heaven I will tear thee joint by joint, joint, and strew this hungry churchyards with thy limbs. And so, like, whoa, okay. <laughs> um, he doesn't proceed to kill Balthasar, but he does proceed to kill uh, the county or count Paris, right? Like this is like fifty lines after this then kills himself, I don't know, another 50 lines or something after that. Like there's this pattern of, of violence. Um, in total, by my count, is responsible, either responsible or tied to the deaths of literally eight people in four days. Um, one of the things I'm gonna get to in just a moment is that the, sh the story wasn't Shakespeare's to begin with. Um, he, he was working with a source and he makes all these changes to his source. And it's so interesting to look at some of those and I will discuss some of those. Uh, on this particular point, it, this, the, let's say this particular point represents a, a significant departure because in the original, Romeo is only tied to, to two deaths and, and it's like over nine months. So 
again, we have something of an unexplained sort of mystery here if, if the romantic conception um, is to you know hold hold any water like why is Shakespeare making Romeo so much more violent and, and in such a short amount of time? I mean he's argu arguably a, a, a serial killer. He actually seems to meet the definition. <clears throat> Juliet's age, another just unbelievable topic. Well, many of you probably already know this. Um, whenever I'm talking to people casually, people are just shocked to learn how old uh, Juliet or is, or rather how young she is, and. Um, this is from one early dialogue in the play, her, her mother and the nurse, where they mention the fact that yeah, she's not 14. So she's literally 13. And, uh, you know, it, it, it's interesting that Shakespeare um, draws attention to this multiple times. Um, here, this idea that she's not 14 is mentioned like five times in, in 10 lines. Um, subsequently, her own father describes her as not yet ripe to be a bride then somehow decides to go ahead anyway and try to marry her off to Paris. Subsequently, how's this for an amazing reference? Another one I, I haven't seen critics discuss, um, the speech of the second chorus, right? The chorus, as you may know, speaks twice. So like the star-crossed lovers, that's the first speech of the chorus, but it also speaks a second time at the beginning of act two. And there, it ref the chorus refers to Juliet, it uses an epithet and it calls her what? It calls her tender Juliet which is quite the reference, <laughs> I think. You know, I mean, tender, like, do I need to find it? It, it, it just, it, it just, it, it's just one more reference to her extreme youth. It makes her the parallel of Adonis um, in Venus and Adonis. Anyway, there's more I can say, but I don't want to go on too much. Um, final thing I did want to say here is just, you might wonder about Elizabethan marital, marital, marital practices. Um, in other words, the, 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 the contemporary norms, right? When did, when did people marry? There's this idea, well, People married at a much younger age than, and and actually that's that's really not the case. Um, the numbers will surprise you with their familiarness. Meaning, uh, in fact, men were married in their mid to late twenties, and women in their early to mid twenties. Um, and a, a source on that, if you're if you are interested, uh, is a book by Anne Jennelly Cook. It's called Making a Match. Um, the full title was or the story, the subtitle is Courtship in Shakespeare in a Society. And uh, it goes over the demographic data. And, uh, and you know, according to her and, and other scholars I've seen, like there's, there's the, the, the data is unequivocal, right? So in other words, she's a shockingly young bride. Like the idea that Shakespeare is meaning to romanticize the love of a 13 year old Italian, <laughs> Italian girl. It, it, you know, it, it kind of boggles the mind that that is the prevailing view, and yet it seems to be. <clears throat> okay, um, maybe my favorite illusion in the whole play. So, um, yeah, this is Juliet awaiting her wedding night. And um, I don't know if anybody knows this story from Ovid's Metamorphoses, the story of Phaeton, um, but this is an amazing reference. It'd be a really fun one to do with your students if you're teaching the play, I think. And and what and I'll talk about exactly what she seems to be saying here and why it's so sort of why why it's so shocking actually. So um again, she's waiting her wedding night. Okay. A little bit impatient, <laughs> more than a little, as you'll see. So she says, so so she's I'll, I'll read the lines in just a second, but you can see she's addressing the horses of of, of, of Phoebus's chariot, right? So Phoebus, as you probably know, drives his chariot across, across the sky. That's how the sun rises and sets, according to Greek, Greek and Roman mythology. And so she says, gallop a pace, right? Like run as fast as possible, you fiery footed steeds toward Phoebus's lodging. So like, you know, toward sunset, such a wagoner or charioteer, right? As Phaeton would whip you to the west and bring in cloudy night immediately. Okay, so what she's saying, <clears throat> um, th this is clearly what she wants, right? She's, uh, uh, she, she actually goes on to use the word in, impatiently later on in, 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 in this speech. It's, it's very clear that that's what it's, what she's expressing is extreme in, impatience, right? She wants the light to fall immediately so she can be with Romeo. And at first glance, I don't, I don't know, you know, maybe nothing wrong with that, except if you're familiar with the story. Right. So 
the story of Phaedon is one of my favorites. It appears to be one of Shakespeare's favorites. He alludes to it a few times, including Richard II and others. And, but like, here's what happens in the story if you don't already know. Um, Phaedon goes to Phoebus. He wants to confirm that he's actually his son. Phoebus says, yes, I am. And to prove it to you, I'll give you a wish. Like one wish, you can have anything you want. Phaeton says, okay, dad, I want to drive the chariot. And Phoebus is like, oh, damn, I, I shouldn't have said that. You know, that's a terrible idea. Like, don't do it. Phaeton insists on doing it. Starts driving, immediately loses control. He's driving, you know, it's simul simultaneously, you know, a horse-drawn chariot and a fireball, right? Because it's literally the sun. <laughs> so he loses control of the chariot. And literally what happens in the story is he's like threatening, not, not just threatening to destroy the world. He's literally destroying like entire regions of the world. Like, and if you're reading the text, um, as I say, it'd be a great one to do with your students. It goes on for like pages. There are like hundreds of lines about like everything he destroys, <laughs> um, like towns, cities, mountain ranges, mouth, you know, rivers dry up, but like people die. So, it, so it, there's just, there's so much in this illusion, like what a rich illusion, right? And the thing is, what's Juliet saying? Like she seems to be saying, I don't care if the whole world has to go up in flames. I want my boy right this second. It seems to be what she's saying. Um, it's another passage that, that there isn't a lot of critical commentary on. Um, and I, I can't help but think that that's because people, critics, whatever, kind of perceive that it, it, it really kind of compromises a more romantic reading of the text. Um, okay, yeah, uh, another basis for skepticism. I think I've just got one or two more. Um, so here's that book I mentioned earlier, Robert Burton's The Anatomy of Melancholy. So as I mentioned, it, 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 it features or contains um, the only contemporary um, Sort of response to the play, meaning we, we basically have no idea how Shakespeare's uh, contemporaries read and understood the play, but this is one important clue. These words I've got highlighted, you probably recognize um, if any of you want to either say or uh, say aloud or in the chat what they are, you know, feel, feel free. Uh, um, but I, but I, I guess, I mean, I'll just go. <laughs> and identify them. It's the final lines, right? Very final lines. So he's actually quoting Shakespeare, which is so cool to see and so interesting. But the key thing is that is the context in which he's doing so. So this volume, um, maybe like many years ago, you, you never heard about it. Um, a third or so of the volume is devoted to love melancholy. And it's basically love as a form of disease. Right? There's like nothing very good <laughs> about it. And, and this particular section, um, it's actually uh, the chapter or section is called the prognostics of love melancholy. And he's basically talking about how everything can go terribly, terribly wrong. And, and you know, lovers so-called um, ending up like killing others, killing themselves, going crazy. You know, it's just one thing after uh, another, like just bringing mayhem and, and death and whatever. And so you can see in the context here, I won't, I won't read all of this, but it's pretty amazing, I think. Um, go to Bedlam, for examples. It is so well known in every village how many have either died for love or voluntary made themselves away that I need not uh, much labor to prove it. Death is the common catastrophe of such persons. How amazing is that? Um, he, he goes on to list a bunch of examples. I mean, here's Pyramus and Thisbe, right? There, there are others. And um, when you read these pages, like it's just example after example after example. And it's so interesting and so important for, for so many reasons. One of which being just, I don't know, I, when I first started studying the play or studying Shakespeare, I, I would have assumed, probably did assume that like Shakespeare and telling the story about these lovers who kill themselves, that he's like doing something new and different, right? And that's like the source of its like power or whatever. And you realize like the complete opposite is, is true. Like meaning stories of love inspired suicide abound, were abounding or we're like, we're like everywhere. And, and, you know, so here's this near exact contemporary of Shakespeare's, if you, right, lived at almost exactly the same time, who's listing all these stories and then even sort of going that next step and, 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 and grouping 
Roman Jouette, you know, the most famous, what's it called? Like, you know, the best story ever told, the best love story ever told with these other stories. And so while there isn't an explicit opinion, there's an implicit opinion here. And, and there's really no, you know, debating what, what he's saying about the play. He, he see, clearly sees it as one more instance of, of, um, well, to quote him, uh, a more insanus, as he calls it, like an insane love. So that's pretty interesting, I think. Yeah, okay. So as I touched on just briefly earlier, um, um, the story wasn't Shakespeare's to begin with. And I really think this should be one of the first things people learn about it. So I'll, I'll explain the screenshot. So you can see the tragical history of Romeus and Juliet. You can see this was published in London, 1587. It was actually first published 1563. I think it appears to have been fairly popular, right? Because it was reprinted several times. Um, by the way, I just found this uh, actually on that site archive, which I'm presenting on later. And um, it was kind of a cool, cool to find. I actually don't know what this is. I'm kind of curious. Maybe some of you know, maybe it's obvious, but I'm actually not sure what that is. I'm kind of curious what the symbol is. And there's a Latin epigraph I'm also curious about. Anyway, um, so the key thing is that wasn't Shakespeare's story. Rather, he worked really closely with with this um, this English version by and, and sorry, um, his name might not even be there. Arthur Brooke is the author. Okay, and um, so Arthur Brooke um, tells the story in in the sixties. Shakespeare retells it like thirty years later in the nineties. Okay, um, before that, the story was already like a hundred years old. So it did originate in in Italy. It was then retold told and retold across the continent. Um, before being told um, again in, 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 in England. Brooke even mentions it being played. So like told on the page, but also performed on stage. So that's really interesting. There's no surviving reference of um, what he's referring to, but it would appear that someone else had actually written a play and, and, and performed it. And, like, isn't that interesting? So yeah, not, nothing remotely original about it. So that's already quite important, I think. Um, but then there's the question of what Shakespeare changes. And um, so here too, wonderful topic, I think, to do with your students. You'd probably have to you know, narrow it down in some ways, but um, there's change after change after change. And like, they're just so significant. And a lot of them are easy easy to miss. So I mentioned already Juliet's age. So in, so in this version, she's 16. There's actually another English version where she's 18. So again, why is Shakespeare making her younger? That's a real problem. Um, uh, as I also mentioned already, Shakespeare's making Romeo way more violent. Um, what are some others? Um, the ending. I, I wrote recently about the ending on my Substack, stack. And um, so at the end of, of Brooke's story, there's literally not a drop of blood. Like there's not a single reference to blood at the end. Um, but there sort of must be blood, but it's right because of, because of how they killed themselves. But or at least in the case of Juliet, right? She stabs herself and it takes poison. That, that's true in, in both. But there's no, re no reference to blood. By contrast, Shakespeare's ending has like over half a dozen references to blood plus at least two, if I recall correctly, references to gore. So like he's taken the story and he's made it explicitly bloody and gory. And, and some of the details are crazy. I'm almost sorry to even mention them, but like Juliet at the end is described twice as not just bloody, but bleeding. Like her parents show up and see her and that's how they describe it. The, the exact line is, look how our daughter bleeds. And then like they notice the knife in her. And so, like it's, it's crazy. And But these are these details are unique to Shakespeare. And it's like, like how are we <laughs> romanticizing this um you might wonder about that i remember i was talking talking to a teacher not too long ago and i asked him how many how many references to blood do you think there are at the end and i said i, I don't think there are any and, and i could kind of understand why he would say that um uh, i mean one one reason for that is that they don't get much attention but the other reason is the popular film versions um just completely uh clean up the text like they, they they include like no visible blood usually um i'm thinking like the zeffirelli and the lerman versions um lerman for example there's like a little tiny bit of blood on juliet's cheek after she puts a gun to her head that's how that one ends at the same time well i don't know, like 
go into that too much at the moment, but um, yeah, um, the the Italian one, I'm now forgetting his name, Zeffirelli, that is just totally clean, um, no, no reference to blood at all. And it's hard not to see that as kind of, well, just really kind of distorting at least departing significantly from the text, if not if not actually distorting distorting it again, precisely because Shakespeare's added it to the original, right? It's like it's like they're kind of going back to the original, if that if that makes sense. Um, one, I don't know. There's so much more to say here, but just one or two more points. Um, jokes, the body jokes, right? All the dirty jokes. Um, you know, uh, one critic, according to one critic, Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet. Um, how do they put it? They just say something like it's just filled, it's just inundated with with uh, lewd, lewd, lewd jokes, and 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 that's totally true. And but like again, they're probably more jokes than people appreciate. And um, with with regard to Shakespeare's source in mind, the point I would observe or draw your attention to is that they're all new, right? One hundred percent of the jokes are new which is interesting okay in my mind that's another basis for not just for skepticism but for even seeing it as a as a satire like why are all these jokes and the other thing i would observe is all of the jokes almost without exception i'll say almost without exception they're jokes about Romeo and Juliet themselves right and so that's just a really interesting thing and you kind of have to ask like maybe there's a reason for that maybe there's something to it maybe maybe Mercutio is not totally wrong to say like Romeo is indiscrim indiscriminately after after sex, for example. Um, yeah, one more I'll just mention very briefly. Um, so one more departure from Brooke, the original, um, how, how the story ends. So um, yeah, this is like a huge, huge, huge change. Um, so in the original, the lovers ascend to heaven their souls escape their bodies um, and they reunite in, in heaven and like we get to share eternity together. And so, you know, like it's a tragedy, but it's kind of a qualified tragedy, you know, like it, you could even say it's like almost a, almost a comedy in the, in the technical sense of like a, a story that ends happily, like or we lose them in this world, but like they live happily ever after in the next. So um, by contrast, so another striking change is the end of, Shakespeare's play, let's just say you search in vain for any indication whatsoever that, that they meet that same supernatural fate. Rather, there's really like every indication that like, let's just say they, they stay in the tomb <laughs> and like there's just no suggestion of ascent. In fact, um, I didn't include these lines, I was almost going to, but you know, Romeo has these lines where he says, here, here uh, will I remain I think it goes up with on with worms that are thy chambermaids. Oh, here set up my everlasting rest, something something like that. It was like this emphatic, like triple reference to here, like I'm not going anywhere. And it's just like, wow, right? With the source sort of in view, it's like this massive, massive departure. Um, and and so yeah, just one more change that sort of needs to be deserves more attention in general and, and kind of needs to be explained, I think, by critics. Um, prone to romanticize the story. Okay. <clears throat> um, yeah, final point here. Um, it might be almost the most important line or lines in the text. So this is the opening prologue and the final couplet. Um, let's say in the final couplet, it seems to me that Shakespeare's suggesting something about how we ought to read and approach the text. And so um, you know, the first 12 lines, basically a summary of, of the action, talks about how the lovers are gonna kill themselves and you know bury their parents' strife, right? The feud's gonna come to end um, and so on. And then the final couplet, the witch, if you with patient ears attend, what here shall miss, our toil shall strive to mend. And what I just find so interesting is this, sort of call, implicit call for our patient attendance, right? Including a reference to the organs of, <laughs> of listening. And what Shakespeare seems to be saying is you like pay attention, like pay really close attention. And I would add to that, what he seems to be saying is don't assume I'm telling the same story. 
right? Don't assume I'm telling the same story as my English predecessors. Don't assume I'm telling the same story as my Italian predecessors. I may be up to something completely different. And like, in my view, you won't be surprised to hear at this point, like that's that's true, right? He, like he, 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 he's, he's, he's doing, he's, he's changing like everything. He's truly transforming the story in my opinion. <clears throat> All right, so on to the question for today. Um, I wanna look at this common critical assumption that Romeo meets Juliet and is like instantly transformed. Um, it's a pretty common point of view. I will say a critic on it in just a moment. Um, and it's quite an important question, I think, because I think it's actually one of the most important questions you can ask about the plot, about, about the significance of the action. Um, why is it so important? As I'll start to show in just a moment, uh, at the beginning of the play, Romeo is deeply unwell. Um, his He's suffering unrequited love for his first love, Rosalind, and he is exhibiting a range of behaviors that, again, I'll show, I'll show you some lines in, in, in just a moment that really suggest that he's already on the path toward self-destruction. And where I'll be going with this is to point to evidence in the text that links his premature self-inflicted death at the end with his condition at the beginning. And, you know, maybe it's already occurring to you like why that's significant. And I'll just, I'll just spell it out. It's significant because it, suggests that he's not killing himself for love for Juliet, right? Like he hasn't even met her at the beginning, right? And so for that trajectory to be there, it just completely compromises, if not like precludes um, the, the sort of conventional understanding of the action of that makes sense. <clears throat> Let's look at Romeo at the beginning. So he's very unwell, so he's antisocial. Um, here's Menvolio, one of his closest friends talking about how he sees him in the woods and then he goes right towards him I made but he was aware or aware of me and stole into the covert of the wood pretty interesting right so he's like actively avoiding the company of his closest friends I think this is the very next passage pretty sure it's definitely in the same scene um his father right saying something very similar, talks about how he's penning himself, it's quite the verb, I think, in his chamber, his bed chamber, so private in his chamber, bed uh, pens, pens himself. So he's avoiding friends, avoiding family, like not, this is not nothing. These are actually pretty significant behaviors, I think. Uh, he's not himself. This too is from his, um, not, I shouldn't say too, but this is from his dialogue uh, with Benvolio early on. One of the things he says, uh, he says, Tut, I have lost myself. I am not here. This is not Romeo. He's some other where. Kind of amazing statement. As you'll see, there's explicit commentary on this question later in the play. I'll show you that in just a moment. Like whether Romeo regains his identity, um, whoops, ever. And, you know, it's a pretty significant question so I guess it's sort of a sub sub question um, I mean because it raises the question whether Juliet even really falls for Romeo in in, in in like the full sense of Romeo if that if that makes any sense <clears throat> like does she ever get to know the true individual or is he already like a shadow of, of, of himself um, so he's also he's not just avoiding people he's avoiding daylight. Um, so also, this also comes from his father. Uh, I'll start reading from here, but, as, but also soon as the all cheering sun should in the furthest east begin to draw the shady curtains from Aurora's bed, away from light steals home my heavy sun. We read this line before, but I'll read it again. And private in his chamber pens himself, shuts up his windows, locks fair daylight out and makes himself an artificial night. So we literally have a young man living in perpetual darkness for for weeks, if not months, um, it, it's never made exactly clear. But um, like, a, but but you know, here Montague begins. Many a morning, have they ever been seen? He's talking about him being in the woods, right? So it's 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 implied. There's been a considerable 
period of time that Romeo has been suffering, love, melancholy. I'm gonna return to these lines down here in just a moment. This is part of the foreshadowing that I was talking about. For now, I'll just draw your attention to this term humor. Um, as you probably know at the time, you know, basically medicine um, revolves around uh, the, the, the four humors. And so to talk about his humors is to, is to suggest he's suffering from a humor, humoral imbalance. And, and so it's just another way of saying he's deeply un, un, unwell. Uh, as I say, I'll come back to those lines in just a moment. Finally, he's thrall to Cupid or you know, enslaved to Cupid. So um, here are a couple of the ref plays references to Cupid. So Mercutius says, you are, and so he's being sarcastic as, as always, you are a lover, borrow Cupid's wings and soar with them a common, above a common bound. Romeo responds, I'm too sore and pierced with his shaft, that's his arrow, to soar with his light feathers. And so bound, I cannot, bound a pitch above dull woe under love's heavy burden do I sink. So um, like basically Cupid's got me, right? He's got me and he won't let go. And like, and like I'm suffering terribly. Um, and he goes on like this. The, 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 one of the things that's notable about this particular statement is that we're now in act one, scene three. And so we've had two or three scenes um, involving hundreds of lines of dialogue where we're, where we're either hearing about Romeo's melancholic condition or he's there and like, uh, you know, uh, demonstrating, show, showing us, commenting, like uh, complaining about his melancholy. And so, I mean, if you think about it, like either we're being sort of built up to this, like he meets Juliet and boom, he's better, right? Like that's kind of the conventional interpretation or something else is, is is going on. And actually his recovery is only apparent and the actual makeover gets worse. Um, okay, yeah, there's still more. There's like so much to say about this topic. He's explicitly sighing, he's explicitly sick, he's explicitly mad. He says something like, I, I'm even more bound than a madman is. Okay, so um, many critics assume that Romeo changes uh, the instant he meets Juliet. And I do want to cite a couple of pieces of evidence that, 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 that they cite. So one super famous lines, right? First time he sees Juliet, there's just this apparently spontaneous outpouring of, of praise, right? Oath she doth teach the torches to burn bright and so on. Um, final call, but did I bid my heart love till now for a swear outside for the never, for I never saw true beauty till this night. So his words appear spontaneous again. They appear to be original, maybe even inspired. And so like, you know, clearly seem to convey change or transformation. Another piece of evidence is that Mercutio seems to observe that Romeo's himself again. So, uh, right, why is not this, this is following a dialogue of, um, why is not this better than groaning for love? Now art thou sociable, now art thou Romeo, right? Clearly picking up on what we heard earlier right before we heard about the unsociable or anti-social Romeo and we heard about how he's not himself and so here's Romeo's sarcastic friend observing that he's different right so clearly he must be changed no here's a critic Harold Bloom <clears throat> so when Benvolio and Mercutio meet up with Romeo he is far from his former self-dramatizing melancholy self and instead just hardly with Mercutio from the moment when he beholds Juliet, a transformation takes place within him. So that's sort of representative of the prevailing critical view. And yet, so there are some real problems with this opposition, I think. Um, one is this question, is Romeo's speech really that inspired and original? So this is the exact same speech, I just hired, uh, so it's first speech in praise of Juliet, I just highlighted a different set of lines, lines that don't often get as much attention. Um, I'll read them and then comment on them a little bit. So show, so sh he's talking about Juliet, of course, and her beauty. So shows, oh my God, that's a tongue twister, a snowy dove trooping with crows as yonder lady over her fellows shows. So, I mean, there's so many things to say about this. The, the verb shows like, okay, so she outshows everyone, but it's not just that, like, She's a dove, right? So she's like the whitest of white or whatever. And they're all crows. Like he's actually slandering all the other women, right? He's not just saying, 
she's really beautiful. He's saying like, she's way more beautiful. And he's even saying like, actually everyone like else is like ugly compared to her. Um, one of the things Mercutio says another t like else elsewhere is that Ro is, is just this, that Romeo is going to speak in these like absurdly exaggerated black and white terms. Right. And that seems to be exactly what he's doing here. Um, like why, why is he going out of his way? It, it's such an inane, um, thing to say to just in the beginning with it isn't it right and um um yeah uh, um yeah I'll, I'll just mention oh a couple a couple things that i wanted to want to mention one is um lysander in a midsummer night stream once he's under the influence of puck's liquor as it as it's called he says the exact same thing so he, the line is who will not change a raven for a dove right a raven's a crow dove exact same word and there, like the statement is self-evidently laughable, right? It's it's like a funny thing, and it's a, you know just one more indication that he's lost his mind, lost his perception, all, all of that. Here's Romeo saying the same thing, right? But in my mind, it's it's, it's basically identical. Um, so, yeah. Um, final thing I, I want to mention here. I guess we're going till 1025, aren't we? So I'm just noticing it's 1017. Um, so yeah, probably not gonna make it all the way through, but any, anyway. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll just mention in my, in my, in my, in my thesis, I, I looked at this question really, really carefully and compared Romeo's words to other Shakespeare's other Petrarchan lovers and tried to show that, um, that, that it, it, it's just not the case that that his pronouncements are original. I, I actually argued, and I, I can't elaborate on it now, but that like every single one of his pronouncements, without exception, is a recycled sonnet conceit or or, or cliche. So, um, yeah, okay, right. So is Roman speech that original? Not not really. Um, the problem with taking Mercutio seriously is like so. Here here are those previous lines, but look at what he goes on to say. Uh, now, now art thou what thou art? That's still sort of positive or affirming uh, by art as well as by nature. Um, that's sometimes a comma. There's a colon. But for this driveling love is like a great natural that runs the line up and down to hide as bobbled in the hole. One of the many, many sexual jokes. Um, I think you can maybe see the problem here, right? We're taking Mercutio seriously when he says this, but like literally his next utterance, like the next clause in this statement is. Yeah, Romeo's just after sex, and it's a it's the same joke as it was. You know, it, it, it's what he says throughout, right? So clearly, that's a problem then to like take this seriously. I, I, he's, he's rather plainly being sar sarcastic. Um, here's the chorus. So evidence Romeo has not changed. Um, there's not much to say about this speech. I'm not going to say too much now, but um, I'll, I'll I'll just say. This, the, 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 this chorus follows immediately after the first meeting of Romeo and Juliet and comments directly on that meeting. And you would think it would say, he's found his new love, he's changed, right? He's transformed. It like says nothing, but it's, it's actually totally and even unambiguously negative about, about the, the titular relationship and emphatically equating Romeo's two loves it's it's it's, it's all like another a, a critic has described it as filled with innuendo as well which is totally true um this is a reference to you know groaning and dying you probably know what that signifies and um so yeah i i, I don't want to say too much of this say too much more about the speech now but um so the friar right so romeo comes to the friar to ask him to marry him to this new girl and um prayer response holy saint francis what a change is here right like oh my god what what are you talking about what's going on and then he goes on to say if ever thou was thyself well I'll, I'll just mention he talks about his size and his groans right so he's drawing further attention to romeo's uh condition at the beginning of the play but then he asks this rhetorical question if ever thou was thyself and these woes thine thou and these woes were all for rosaline and art thou changed right pretty explicit commentary on this question of whether Romeo has changed and, and evidently the rhetorical question suggests no he doesn't you know think for one second that Romeo has changed um, if we step back and think about it then we've got the three most important commentators so the chorus the friar and Mercutio 
through irony or sarcasm, all essentially denying that Romeo has changed. Um, finally, yeah, Romeo continues to be thrilled to Cupid. We saw that he was early on when he's attributing his conduct to Cupid um, with Juliet. He's suggesting that on this point too, he, he hasn't changed. So this raises the question, is the story in fact built around the titular couple, right? Structurally, is that what we see? Or is it built around the male protagonist and his mental decline? And what I want to observe now is that if we go back to those early scenes, we find that Romeo's death is foreshadowed literally more than a dozen times. And I just want to show you a few of these. So um, here are these lines back, back again, the speech with his, from, from his father, black and portentous must this humor prove less good counsel may the cause remove. Um, I mean, portentous hardly needs any sort of defining, right? It is suggesting calamity. Black is, uh, I mean, same, 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 same thing. Um, like it, 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 Montague is very much saying, like based on the behavior we see, right? Romeo avoiding sunlight and everything, like unless something, unless he benefits from good counsel, so unless he like really, really gets help, he's gonna meet like a bad end, like the worst possible end, which, you know, I'm pretty sure is <laughs> what happens. <clears throat> um, here, Romeo talks about a sick man and sadness making his will. He's clearly talking about himself um, and that of making a will, of course, a document for the dying. So it appears to be another instance of foreshadowing. Oops, um, I'll just focus on this one line and see if I can get through a few more slides here in the last few minutes. Here's Benvolio, his friend, in deeply ironic lines suggesting he should get better by getting worse. <laughs> so turn giddy and be help means like helped by backward turning. So he's basically saying, you know, go even crazier, uh, go even madder, which is arguably what happens. Then there's Romeo himself. This, so this is right after the Queen Mab speech, right before the party, and Romeo has this premonition, right? My mind misgives some consequence yet hanging in the stars shall bitterly begin his fearful date with this night's revels and expire the term of a despised life closed in my breast by some vile forfeit of untimely death. Wow, right? And like, look at that language. And I would suggest like, if nothing else, we have to grapple with lines, implications like this, even if we wanna play, read the play romantically, you know, are we supposed to understand Romeo's death as like this premature, like, act of self, like this vile act of self forfeit. It's just amazing that those lines are there. And it's one more instance of foreshadowing that appears before he's even met Juliet. Um, yeah, what's he like at the end? I'm just gonna whip through these. Here's Balthazar observing, he looks pale and wild. He's like gonna do something crazy. Here's Romeo himself um, describing his intents as savage wild, right? Here's Romeo threatening Paris, calls himself mad and desperate. Uh, he warns him, put not another sin upon my head by urging me to fury, right? Basically suggesting that his murder of Paris is an act of fury. I don't know how you go from fury, like being motivated by fury to being motivated by love. So it would appear that his behavior proves black and calamitous indeed, as his father and others suggested. So summing up, when we, when we was deeply unwell at the beginning, he appears to recover, in my view, doesn't. And this appears to explain the bloody, violent ding. And... Um, so I think you can see how that raises issues with, with how we usually explain the ending and what motivates Romeo. I would suggest about the structure or the trajectory, it's less like a roller coaster than uh, a straight, rapid, phaeton-like descent. And um, I can't show you, but at the very end of the play, there's actually another reference to that that story, it says the son for sure, sorrow will not show his head. And it's this reference to Phoebus after his son has died. And, it, and, it, and it's this amazing uh, reference that suggests we're supposed to understand perhaps Romeo's behavior as in some way mirroring that of, of Phaetons. Um, I'm gonna skip that. Yeah, I had some precedents and parallels. I'm gonna skip those. Here are some skeptical takes. Great book. Um, if you are looking for other resources, this is, um, probably the best book I'm aware that approaches the play more skeptically. So Sasha Roberts, which is called Romeo and Juliet. This is a really interesting article on erotomania. I'm gonna skip those quotes. Um, and just briefly some, some ideas for assignments if you're teaching the play. So comparing to Brooke, you would 
probably have to lim limit limit the scope here significantly, right? Like maybe just look at the ending of the two plays, um, like you know the heaven versus well, just remaining in the tomb. Uh, the role of Cupid in both Shakespeare and his sources, especially Ovid. This is like just the most interesting topic, I, I think. Cupid is depicted in Ovid as this tyrant and sadist, if you can believe it. He and his mother Venus, they like they're tower mad imperialists they go they, they know what tower they wield and they like go around deliberately subjugating people and uh, yeah it's, it's kind of wild um studying the context studying the play in the context of romeo uh, sorry of, of renaissance lovesickness including this Bur this book i mentioned robert burton's anatomy melancholy um there are many other materials but it's a really interesting way to look at it i think and then just challenging them you know to interpret the text more than one way so textual basis for the romantic interpretation right like again there are those right and then but there are also these other ways and so I, th I think you know maybe more than most other texts uh, Roman Julia offers this opportunity to to develop like different and even competing lines of evidence if, if that makes sense to put it that way and so that's something that's pretty cool um I think I've used up all the time whoops um if anyone has any thoughts or questions, I'd be happy to take them now. I'm just returning to that. Um, otherwise, I think we're out of time, so. Yeah, any thoughts or questions, anybody? No, okay. I will uh, simply thank you for, for coming. I hope you found that interesting. Um, feel free to be in touch. Uh, for any reason, if you'd like to be, it's my email is jmcgee at wpga.ca. And, um, and yeah, be happy to hear from you. Um, if you're interested in following my work in one Substack, it's all, it's all freely available. Um, and you know, I'd love to, love to have you. Lots, lots more to come on, on there. So yeah. Okay. Yeah. You're welcome, Gloria. Thanks, Karen. Appreciate it. Thank you. That's kind of you, Karen. Yeah, thanks everyone, I'll let you go, see ya.